With the previous presentations discussing when a marriage does or doesn't end, hence when adultery can occur despite one or both believers in a marriage or the local government, thinking that the marriage really ended when it actually did not in God's sight, the question on the other side of the issue is, when does a marriage approved by God actually begin? Just as we can see that even though a government law can often wrongfully declare a marriage over by granting divorces that are not biblical in God's sight and remarriages that are then also not approved by God, likewise we cannot take the local culture and government's judgments for granted when it decides the beginning point in marriage. Matthew 5.32, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the account of porneia, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery, reminding that this applies to marriages between believers only when cross-referenced with 1 Corinthians 7. This tells us that the world's decisions of when a marriage ends and starts is irrelevant. If a believing man divorces a believing wife, the state or even the church might honor it while God does not. And then the state and even the church might approve of another man marrying that woman, while God considers that second marriage to be adultery as neither the divorce or second marriage was honored in God's sight. That is to say, if the end of a marriage in God's sight can't be defined by church or culture, then neither can its beginning, such that people can decide when a covenant in God's sight is or isn't made in the first place arbitrarily. Of course, there's a difference for the beginning of a marriage in that something that people willingly do on earth begins the covenant. But under God's law, once that action occurs, God considers the two to be married and his laws apply for it thereafter, that they should then not divorce or otherwise commit adultery against each other. In the modern West, many are familiar with a wedding ceremony and romanticize the imagery of a bride and groom both saying I do to each other in front of witnesses. There's certainly nothing inherently wrong with these rituals around marriages, but is this really the point where God considers two people to be bound? After all, marriage rituals differ all over the world tremendously. Some of them are arranged and don't even really involve consent at all. Like Isaac and Rebecca in scripture, there was no signing of documents at any legal office under any nation's law at all, but all of these are treated as legitimate marriages in God's sight. Somehow, the marriage covenants decidedly had beginning points despite a lack of government or church oversight. Now, many Christians differ on how much we should consult the Old Testament laws for how we should obey God to follow his will today. For sure, Hebrews addresses why we no longer burn sacrifices or make ceremonial washings based on qualifications of clean and unclean, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10. In short, these rituals symbolize the effect of Christ paying for sins and making us spiritually clean. On the other hand, the law is often quoted in the Old Testament. For example, Paul quotes, Do not muzzle the ox while he is treading the grain in two of his letters in the New Testament, which comes from Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 in the law. Jesus makes a reference to Moses' law regarding honoring, honoring parents, and many New Testament verses cite laws related to marriage and adultery, taking nothing away from these laws being just as universal as do not steal or do not commit murder. It stands to reason that God's laws on this issue would not change either. Or, consider, if Israel simply had some law that contradicted God's idea of when a marriage did or did not start, then Israel would have had laws that caused people to commit adultery, potentially. In other words, as mentioned before, if mankind were allowed to change the definition of the threshold for when a marriage began, as it were, then there would be no stopping people from nullifying adultery laws altogether. For example, if God was against betrothal, 
as being the definition of the beginning of the marriage covenant, such that Israel punished violations of the betrothal as adultery, then a genuine marriage could effectively be blocked. To really illustrate an example, imagine, for example, a man and a woman under Israel's law being betrothed to each other. Now imagine that the woman in the betrothal runs away from that betrothal and somehow marries another Israelite, perhaps after running away from Israel altogether or off to some other culture's law and got married there. Who would God consider her to be married to? Consider this very carefully. Israel would say that the betrothal was binding and such a woman committed adultery, whereas God would actually be in favor of the woman legitimately being married to the other man whom she fully officially married and perhaps also even consummated her marriage with at that point despite Israel's law. But God would then tolerate Israel punishing them by death for adultery even though she was in fact in a legitimate marriage where God actually wanted them both to be at that point while only being betrothed under Israel's law. How would God allow Israel then to have an inaccurate and contradictory definition of marriage that could override his actual intentions of his timeless marriage law in such a way? Although this example gets a bit ahead of the presentation, the point is to establish that whatever Israel's laws or customs may have been, that may or may not need to be followed exactly today, what we cannot allow is the suggestion that Israel could have had a law strictly enforced that blatantly overrides and contradicts his real actual law. And in fact, that's how Jesus often rebuked the Pharisees for coming up with their own laws and customs that made it impossible to obey God's law in some situations. This is not like Moses allowing divorce, which is never something that a man was required to do, but was only allowed to do, and then it was regulated. Moses' law suggested that some sins were overlooked, such as divorce, to be sure, but it's another issue entirely to suggest that Moses' law had something in it that opened the door to force people to sin against God's timeless law such as what could happen with betrothal if that was inaccurate in God's sight. With that, to find out what initiates and or obligates a marriage covenant, we can see a great deal of evidence in the law for when this occurs in God's sight. Jesus quoted Genesis 2.24 to describe marriage. A man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh then explaining that the two are no longer one and are not to separate. Paul makes another reference to this passage when he explains why it's wrong to use a prostitute in 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20, because sexual relations with a prostitute cause him to become one flesh with a prostitute. This is to say that the act of becoming one flesh occurs with sexual re relations. Exodus 22 verses 16 and 17. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. As a man in this virgin or maiden, marriageable woman in any case, became one flesh, the law of Exodus 22.16 shows that sexual relations to a marriageable woman obligates a legal marriage unless the father refuses to allow it to occur. The man must pay the bride price either way, but otherwise nothing resembling punishment occurs for either the man or the woman. They are simply to be considered married. Of course, however, this situation isn't the normal one for starting a marriage. As mentioned, the second part of this law allows for the father to override this end result, leading us into what the legalities and rituals of marriages were actually about, the giving of a daughter to a man to be her husband. Many Old Testament laws portray a particular relationship between a father and daughter with an extreme force of authority, 
far beyond anything between a father and a son. All of Numbers chapter 30 shows an example of how great that authority over his daughter is and how it goes from him to the woman's husband later. The legalities of a marriage in its normal course amounts to the passage of this authority and the law of Israel was written to protect everything that recognized this course of a woman passing from her father to her husband. When a woman is, quote, in her father's house, this era of her life, he has authority to override a vow between her and God, according to Numbers 30, which can explain why the father could block what would become a marriage under the law in this case. But as established, the two became one flesh, and the only potential violation of this so-called premarital affair is against the father, and aside from the father's will against the marriage, the act of these relations is simply to live out the marriage covenant. The ordering of these statements shows this as the normal course, so in the event that there is no father to factor into the situation, nothing prevents that a man and woman simply must commit after their sexual act as the beginning of what is to be a marriage in God's sight. As mentioned in earlier presentations, I want to reinforce that in today's world of casual sex, sexual acts often involves unbelievers, and 1 Corinthians 7.15 allows a believing man and woman to be free of a marriage to an unbeliever if the unbeliever leaves. So to be absolutely clear, this is not an advocacy of believers to chase down unbelieving sexual partners of the past. While the believer should be willing to marry in such a situation, if the word isn't given, then the commitment is assumed to be one that constantly stops and starts, as the unbeliever makes no promise to return since they avoid the statement of commitment. At, on this point, when Jesus talked to the Gentile woman at the well and told her about how she had five husbands with the latest man not even being her husband, he makes a distinction to emphasize that her latest relationship did not even involve a promise of commitment, even after her leaving five husbands was already profoundly sinful. From, un from this I conclude that, while a believer should be willing to marry an unbeliever after sexual relations, without the word given from the other in a relationship that avoids a word of commitment, the unbeliever is essentially constantly leaving the other since no promise to return is made. With a father alive and involved, the normal course of a marriage involved a betrothal where a woman is promised to a man by the father and the two would be treated as belonging to each other, husband and wife, and all adultery laws applied to them. And for a betrothal to be broken, a man would have to give a woman a divorce certificate just as much as after he took her, which makes enough sense since the certificate was just evidence for a woman that she did not leave her husband to avoid the normal consequences that would apply equally during the betrothal. At this point, some might still think of it as nonsense to think that the concept of betrothal should be applied like today's concept of getting engaged. Many traditions of Israel's father-daughter relationship remain today, such as a man asking her father's permission to marry, some aspects of rituals referring to a father giving his daughter in marriage, but in the modern West, fathers tend to be less possessive of their daughters as far as who they should marry and or sometimes they just aren't consulted at all. Some believers then conclude that consummation of marriage is simply the one point at which God considered a couple to be married. As mentioned, this view has a lot of problems because it suggests that Israel broke God's actual law by punishing violations of betrothal because a man who slept with a betrothed woman would actually be her true husband in God's sight while Israel would punish him and the woman with death. Furthermore, for today's culture, a man would be foolish not to have sexual relations with his fiancée as soon as possible, all ceremonies aside, so as to prevent her from being legitimately taken away from him before a wedding day. More generally, 
If a betrothal could be broken, it would be foolish for the more certain of the two involved to postpone a marriage to a later date. So can betrothal really be equated to today's engagement? As mentioned, betrothal normally involved the presence of a father, but the law covered a particular edge case for the situation of a slave girl where the normal course of marriage would not occur that tells us a great deal. Leviticus 19, 20-22 if a man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave assigned to another man and not yet ransomed or given her freedom, a distinction shall be made. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. The man, however, must bring a ram to the entrance to the tent of meeting for a guilt offering to the Lord. With the ram of the guilt offering, the priest is to make atonement for him before the Lord for the sin he has committed, and his sin will be forgiven. As covered in previous presentations, the offenders in this scenario aren't punished with death because the woman cannot fully belong to the man to whom she is pledged to in this situation yet, nor is she under the authority of her father so as to commit the sin of playing the whore while still in her father's house, which would result in her being stoned according to Deuteronomy 22.21. And yet we have to notice that the woman is still somehow pledged to be married. The man who slept with her is guilty and does not become her husband after sleeping with her. The woman is still very much considered to be claimed by the man she is pledged to, despite, firstly, not being fully legally his, hence the reason why she isn't put to death, and her father not being involved to give her. Even with all of these conditions removed, God still considers the woman to be bound to the man and cannot then become bound to anyone else just because she is pledged. Not fully legally his, not given by the father, but just a pledge between the two causes the two to be bound with no one being allowed to take her away from him. This verse in particular firmly shows that just a pledge between a man and a woman binds the woman to the man even before any other legal approval, as a pledge binding even between a free man and a slave woman who still has a legal barrier between their joining. In summary, we can see that sexual relations with a marriageable woman obligates marriage from the straightforward law of Exodus 22.16, repeating that we know that unbelievers leaving the situation afterward is a different issue according to 1 Corinthians 7, 15, and that a situation is much different if the woman is a prostitute as a man is forbidden to join to a promiscuous woman in any context, whether referenced in 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20 or the law in Deuteronomy 22, 13-21 as this is the point where the two become one flesh. Or, the marriage covenant itself begins with the pledge to be married, following that it is the promise of becoming one flesh in step with what Genesis 2.24 says. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, noticing that she is called his wife in the first place, and then the two will, it says, become one flesh. This oft-repeated scripture on marriage portrays a woman being a man's wife before they become one flesh, because it says the two, already described as being husband and wife at this point, will become one flesh. And so the agreement is when the covenant of marriage begins, whether it's called an engagement, a betrothal with all the legalities involved with a woman's father, or just being pledged, because that promise is a declaration that the two will become one flesh. Summed up one last time to be absolutely clear, marriage in God's sight begins with one of two actions. A woman, a man having sexual relations with a marriageable woman, a virgin, widow, abandoned, believing woman, or a pledge between the man and a woman that they will get married which is to say that they promise each other that they will become one flesh in the future with no other legalities needing to be involved.